join with us today as we begin with a great song, Not To Us, by the Moorhead Messengers. Join in, please.
What great music from our Moorhead messengers. Hi, I'm Brian Wilborn. I'm the pastor emeritus uh, here at Moorhead United Methodist Church, and I'm filling in for Pastor Veronita Alvord, uh, who is on assignment even as we speak, and we're praying for her and wishing her the best on her assignment and look forward to her to getting back. I'll be here one more Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, we'll continue uh, in the 13th uh, chapter of Matthew um, with the parables, the stories that Jesus has uh, in that chap uh, chapter. And uh, getting back online here, it's kind of like turning to the page in the Bible. So there'll be just a little hesitation here as uh, I get back online so I can read the scriptures in large print edition, uh, if you catch my drift on that. Uh, we're going to be looking at the 13th chapter, continuing here with the parables that Jesus is teaching to the people on the shore. He's using the boat as a pulpit, and uh, the people are listening, and here's what he's saying. He put before them another parable, beginning with verse 24 of the 13th chapter. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared as well. And so the field workers of the householder came to him and said, Boss, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, Well, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, Well, then do you want us to go and, and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you'd uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And he put to them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field it's the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all of it was laven. Jesus told crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what he had spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus left the crowds, went into his house. Here is the reading of the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your stories, for how they jolt us into a view of the kingdom. Be with us today and help us find the courage to be jolted anew by the stories you tell. It is in your holy name that we offer our prayer of anticipation. Amen. We're continuing in this 13th chapter of Matthew, and I will next Sunday too. We'll finish it up. We have... We have wrung out of this chap, uh, chapter some wonderful views and meanings about what Jesus is talking about here, especially, well, he's talking about the kingdom of God. 
And we're dealing here with more of the agricultural and growth parables. Specifically, I want to, to join in with uh, uh, the parable about the, the wheat and the weeds. These parables are designed to get inside of us and show us from the inside what the experience of the kingdom of God is like. Um, today's reading is, is exactly like the pattern of last week's reading where Jesus is teaching the people from the boat, boat and then when he's alone with his disciples, he explains only to them a meaning of the parable. He does the same thing with the, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. It's a reasonable and a very good meaning, and uh, I purposely left it out of the reading today again. Uh, although this, this great interpretation, it, it, it opens the disciples' hearts and minds to be especially aware of the powerful elements of the stories Jesus tells. But again this week, I don't want to focus on how Jesus informed his ministry team. I want to take the treasure of this parable of the wheat and the weeds and share with you how this parable has, has gotten into me with the hope that it has gotten into you or will get into you at some point uh, in your life. A word of caution here, though. Don't for one minute accept the way this parable has gotten into me as the meaning for you. It's not even the meaning for me. That's the thing about Jesus' parables. Their substance is about the kingdom of God. And while they call up wonderful and consistent images about the kingdom, the image is so magnificent, all the meanings just dissolve into the grandeur of the kingdom. Pastor Veronita has been calling us toward greater appreciation for the gifts of the Spirit. And you know, when she, she enumerates the gifts of the Spirit, and for the sake of embarrassment, uh, I, I won't enumerate them, but I will get to that last one that she just loves, and it's called self-control. Self-control. These gifts, you see, these gifts are clues to the nearness of the kingdom of God and its activity in us. And it is well that we see them, that we receive them, that th we have them work in and through us. The parables help. This one about the wheat and the weeds got into me on Monday morning and it opened the special gift of the spirit of self-control to me. And it had me blurt out the title for my homily and send it off to the church office very quickly. And the, the title was going to be, Being Right is No Excuse for Being Mean. You go, well, how did you get that out of this? Well, let me tell you how it got into me. Just think about the characters and the props in this story. We got the good guys and we got the bad guys. That's pretty normal, huh, for a good story. The good guys, the householder and his field workers, they are the good ones. And then we got the bad guys, the enemy of the householder and his agents. So we got the good wheat seeds of the householder, the, the seeds that he sows, and then we've got the weed seeds of the enemy of the householder, which his agents sow. Who collects weed seeds? And why? Well, it can't be very much of a good purpose to collecting weed seeds. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, but I, I just had to comment. The good guys are putting in the time and the hard work of tilling up that land and planting those good seeds and tending and harvesting a great wheat crop. Yay, yay, good for them. The bad guys are not hardworking, really, because they are sowing where somebody else has prepared. Mm -hmm. But they're crafty. They're sneaky. They do their nasty deed under the cover of darkness. They want to secretly destroy all the rewards of the good guy's hard work. Boo! Boo! Shame on them! You see, Jesus has got us set up here. He has got us set up for the story of a disaster. The good guys, you see, they are just good guys. They, they trust the process of planting the seed. 
They plant the seed and then they go off doing other things that are required. They come back a little time later and they see a sheen of green on the land as the miracle of crop growth happens. The little seedlings are coming up. It's all good. So they think. Then a few weeks later, there they are. They see them. Oh, they look like wheat, but they're not wheat. They are blasted weeds, and they're all in the wheat, just as if they've been sowed at the same time. Hmm. What's the boss going to say? We have to tell him. We'd be better, too, to, to have a plan when we go, uh, so that when he goes off the deep end, we can at least say something. We'll, we'll, we'll offer, we'll offer to painstakingly and carefully walk through the entire field and pull up those weeds. Can you imagine those worried field hands approaching the boss? They take a deep breath and they tell him the bad news. They give him the proposed solution and they step back as to not take the full brunt of his wrath. And then came the jolt. Then came the unexpected answer. The first jolt in this parable came from the householder's confidence. When they asked him, he was confident. Yes, he had sown the good seed. And he had some equal confidence in the fact that he knew that the weeds were sown by his enemy. He didn't hesitate. Oh, they were sown by the enemy. And the field workers hadn't thought about that. Why, those dirty, rotten, sneaky. Just say the word, boss, and we'll make them sorry. Can't you just see the householder under the influence of self-control? saying to those field workers, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. No, re no reason to return meanness for meanness. Well, okay, boss, but, but we'll go down on our hands and knees and we'll crawl through that field and we'll pull up every one of those weeds. And then came another jolt in this parable when the householder says, Leave the weeds alone. It's a waste of your good effort. And it would be a ruination for the wheat we can salvage. When harvest comes, we'll pull up every plant and we'll separate and thrash the wheat and burn up the weeds. It'll, it'll be a great bonfire of celebration. We might not have the crop we expected, but there'll be enough to celebrate, celebrate about in the light of the wheat fire. And our enemy? <laughs> we know who he is. Our enemy will be crushed by our success. And who knows? We could even share our bread with our enemy and destroy him by making him our friend. Now, folks... Don't give this another thought until we celebrate harvest time. You see, humanly speaking, the householder had every reasonable right to return the meanness that had been dealt him. My enemy sowed wild grass in my field of wheat. Huh, I'll sow brambles in his so he'll have to suffer when he pulls them up. I'll show him what justice looks like. And when his crops fail and he's sitting at his empty table hungry, then maybe he'll remember his dastardly deeds. It's only right. Hmm. It may be right. And it may be reasonable. But Jesus' parable points out that there is another direction to take. Just like pulling up weeds destroys the good plants, meanness to others, even when it's justified, pulls up something good in the hearts of those who dole it out. Even when we are right, it leaves us a bit more hollow 
inside than when we started. The kingdom of God, my brothers and sisters, knows nothing of meanness. The kingdom of God knows nothing of returning evil for evil. It is so easy for us to go there. And I'm speaking to you as one with experience in this. It's so easy for us to go there. We can make a case for it. We can make an unbeatable case. But Jesus holds up the vision of the kingdom of God before us to keep us in check. The light of of the kingdom enhances the gift of righteousness. We are called to live out in a troubled world. That same light exposes our righteous-based meanness for what it is. It is as destructive to us as it is to those toward whom it's directed. The great leader, the great civil rights activist, congressman, Follower of Jesus, the Honorable John Lewis, spoke these words. Quote, We are one people with one family. We all live in the same house. And through books, through information, we must find a way to say to people, that we must lay down the burden of hate. For hate is too heavy a burden to bear. And again, I, I loved looking into John Lewis's weary, loving, and resolute eyes when he said, Put hatred and violence behind you. Don't become like those you're fighting. Is there any doubt, my brothers and sisters, that John Lewis had the parable of the wheat and the weeds living in him? He was an unrelenting prophet for civility and equality and decency. There were nasty weeds all around him waiting to choke him and rob him of the nutrients of strength to carry on his fight of love. How easily he could have rightly devoted his life to hating and destroying all the weeds that threatened him. But his words and actions reveal a heart that knew that while meanness might destroy the threatening weeds, it would also destroy him and the movement he championed. Well done, good and faithful servant. You rest from your labors. You rest from your suffering. Your relentless fight graced with self-control, will stand as a beacon to all to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Thank you, John Lewis, for living out the landowner's mercy for his weed-planting enemies. Jesus gives us the parable of the wheat and the weeds that it might get in us. The Spirit gives us the gift of self-control to the end that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, might remove from our playbook justified meanness in living out the good news of the gospel. God help us. Jesus help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your
Your stories are so magnificent. They are filled with grace and filled with images of what the fruits of the Spirit are all about. In our world today, so torn apart by hatred, we pray that the image of the householder who had mercy toward those who had wronged him will be planted eternally in our hearts as it was in John Lewis's heart. That we might exercise self-control as we live among the troubled and being ourselves troubled at times. God, have mercy upon us and lead us into a new light that we might proclaim the gospel with freshness and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
incredible. You know, I could see that householder and all his family and the field hands gathering around that bonfire where all the weeds were burned, singing that song. I'll sing a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies whom I love. Go forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to sing a hallelujah in the presence of your enemies. And may self-control, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, go with you and grant you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.